Hello, I'm Mitra Sorrells in the Focus Wire studio at Alice, and I am joined by Peter Kern, CEO of Expedia Group. Welcome, Peter. Great to be here. Thanks for having me. So I want to start by talking about the fact that you're coming up on your four-year anniversary as CEO yeah. of Expedia Group. I don't know if you'd say that went fast or slow, or, um, but would curious to just get your reflections a bit on that time. What, what do you know now that you didn't know then? Oh, God, a lifetime of information, <laughs> I think. Um, First of all, I, I was saying to somebody recently that it's a lot like having kids, you know, long days, short years. Like, yeah. I can't believe it's been four years, but in it, it felt like for, you know, like every day, every grind felt like forever. Um, you know, we took on an enormous amount as a company. I mean, we all faced COVID and there was all of that. But even, you know, we took that moment, as I think we've talked before, uh, to really try to transform our company and set it up for the future and use that time as effectively as we could. And that meant, on, meant taking on a huge transformation technologically with our brands, uh, with how we go to market, you know, really almost everything. Yeah. Um, and, you know, that's, that's a huge undertaking. Um, and uh, I'm sure there are a thousand things I do differently now, but in the aggregate, I think we've made an amazing transformation, amazing progress in four years, which isn't that long in a company's life. Yeah. Um, and it's really hard to, you know, we were the innovator in the category 25 odd years, 27 years ago. Um, we led for a long time and then it got crowded. It got different. You know, we, we chased a lot of things and it's, it's a hard undertaking to really say, we're going to reset ourselves up to really lead again. Uh, but I'm incredibly pleased with the progress we've made. I, I think we're in a remarkably different place and, and, um, and I'm really excited about that. So I've learned tons, how to make a lot of mistakes, you know, how to, how to grind through the stuff you get wrong, and uh, but how to get to you know collectively to a to a better place as a company. Well, I mean, you know, as you said, you've certainly accomplished a lot. I mean, and I know way back when you started, we heard you right away talking about the need to yeah. tighten things up a bit, and mm -hmm. you know that there was the tech uh, migration and all of that. I, I want to kind of talk through some of the things that stand out to me as some of the highlights sure. um, over the last couple of years. Sure. So, of course, first of all, the one key. Mm. uh rollout in july tell us a little bit uh, now what you're seeing um from that how are customers engaging um and and then a little bit about next steps with that sure yeah i mean we're really excited about one key i mean one key is in a way the way we finally tied all our brands and everything we do together in a way that the consumer could understand like you know sometimes at a company you're all caught up in your own right. underwear of like how you do things but it's really how the consumer perceives it the benefits they get and how they in turn, you know, use those to their benefit. And, and that creates, you know, a better, more thriving business for us. So for us, you know, what we're already seeing is a lot of what we hoped for, which is the cross shopping, people moving between brands, people getting to better understand the linkages and that, oh, I have value, I can use it somewhere else. And, and um, that's really the core of it. But it's also in many ways, the idea of just bringing together the holistic nature of you know our little marvel universe of you can get everything you need in our universe and we'd like to keep you in our universe and make sure you get the full benefit of all of that so one key wasn't just like tying them together it's also improving all the member discounts all the benefits implied at the different levels and everything else and um, you know we're seeing consistently strong growth in in the membership base we're seeing usage grow we're seeing cross shopping grow um, you know, a lot of these things take time because people don't travel, you know, every week, most right. except for us, right. people don't travel every week. So it takes a little while for them to circle back, you know, if they take one or two trips a year, but we're it, starting to see that behavior and that's exciting. And where we stand today, is it still just U.S.? It's, ju it's still just U.S., but it's literally rolling out in half a dozen countries uh, over the course of the next six months or so. Like we're, details aren't out on all of it, but it's coming to a bunch of our major markets in the rest of the world this year. Okay. And it's also tied in then to your kind of mobile app strategy is correct as well, as far as the, just driving direct business, getting yeah. people to come direct to you. Yeah. Well, look, we want it to be app first. Um, we think, you know, it's where the consumers are going. It's where consumers are accustomed to shopping. We want our app to be the best in the category and it is. Um, and, and that's, it's not one app, you know, it's, it's a right. few apps. So um, part of the, journey of the migration has been to get them all onto the same front end so that all the experiences could be similar and people would understand them as one group of experiences. But yeah, apps hugely important. We continue to move more and more consumers to the app. Um, it's the simplest interface. Uh, it's the, you know, it's 
got the best newest features as we roll them out. We roll everything out first in the app. So um, app is really where the energy goes first and where the consumer can get the best experience. And it is, it is tied to one key, but more it's tied to the whole idea that we want to be the best consumer experience. We want to be the best product offering. We want to be the best, uh, you know, uh, loyalty program. We want, we have the best service we have. The, so it's all part of that. Um, and the app is just like to cement that, like right. you come to us first because you know, you're going to get the best experience with us full stop end to end including the shopping experience, including loyalty, including service, including everything. So that's what we're trying to drive. And we think the app is the simplest interface for that. But of course, there are many consumers, you probably do it yourself. Sometimes you're shopping on your iPad, sometimes right. you're on your right. phone, other times you're on a desktop somewhere. Like we want it to be seamless for you and wherever you go, you can pick up where you left off and you can continue your journey. Okay, so and when we talk about the app, of course, I want to now transition to talk about generative AI for a bit. You folks jumped in early. Yep. Um, you put yourself out there. I think it was the plug-in first, and then mm -hmm. you had the integration with the app. Yep. What have you been learning from that, first of all, as we're coming up on about a year? We've learned a lot. I mean, I think we were all excited about it. You know, like a lot of things you get excited about, it does not always like lighting a fire, and right. it just turns into a forest fire. It, you know, it was it's a learning process. Being in early is a lot about gathering data and getting smarter about what consumers want, don't want, what the challenges are with you. So we've been, I'd say on several journeys, there's like the journey within the journey, which is how do you make generative AI more usable? Consumers don't always know how to engage. They right. don't know what to ask. They don't. So there's a lot of uh, discovery around helping them and nudging them and helping them get to the right questions or solutions or making things simpler than I didn't want to write a whole question. I just wanted to, you know, push a button. So, so consumers kind of go in and out. Um, we're seeing, you know, good usage, but I don't think it's a game changer as yet. Right. Um, we are using generative AI across the business in many ways that you wouldn't necessarily see. So that could be anything from how we're using it in service, um, how we're using it for our service people to record conversations, summarize those conversations, take pain out of the work for some of our employees. Uh, and you're going to see it, I think, as we evolve, and this will be a big year for it, of how we use it through the whole journey for you. So it won't always be like, I want to ask some big, long question about a trip to wherever. Um, it may just be little things and how it helps you to use our other products better and interact better and nudge you along and educate you in the process, all with this thread of like, from end to end, how do we make it? How do we use generative AI to make the experience better and simpler? And so you can start from, I want to go to Paris for a week, what should I do? All the way through to, how do I compare these things better? Which one's closer to the metro, whatever? And all the way to the end, which is service, like something, something went wrong or I need to change something or whatever. And we're really looking at using it through the entire experience. So we're getting to, it sounds like what you're saying is we're kind of going to get to the point that it's truly woven and embedded into everything. And it's less about, I'm going to go into a chat bot and I'm going to. Yeah, I think, I think, you know, we'll see and yeah. we're learning and I could be where more than likely I'm wrong, but <laughs> um, I believe what consumers want is they want it to help a few consumers maybe be all in on like, I'm going to chat my way through commerce. But many are like, oh, you know, I like these three hotels and can you just show them to me? And now I'm going to look at them in a traditional way and compare them. I'm going to pick one and then, oh, I want to add something. What's the easy way? So it's going to be like the assistant, the, yeah. the thing that's with you. In some cases, it will be, you know, very minimal. And in other cases, it will be like, I don't know what to do now. What should I do? And, and real discovery or real service solutions or those bigger problems to solve. Have you started to talk at all about these concept, this concept of AI agents? I have to believe that that's, yep. you know, that's something we're hearing a lot about. And of course, as, as we've thought about it, we start to wonder what does this potentially mean for search, let's say, if it's yep. not the human going to an app or a website and it's this AI agent that's doing it. I mean, yeah, I mean, I think there's a lot of ideas wrapped up in that, you know, um, everything from, you know, oh, will anybody need Google anymore or right. will anybody search the old fashioned way uh, or all of those things. I, I think there's a missing step in there. I mean, be awesome if we didn't need Google anymore, <laughs> but, <laughs> but uh, to, to get to our consumers. But I think there's a few pieces missing in that, which is I personally believe that the journey of travel discovery by and large is part of the entertainment. Like 
most consumers aren't looking for the easy button. Like I'm going to Egypt for a week. Tell me what I should do. Good book. I'm done. Yeah, that's They're like, a good oh, point. You, you know, it, we do it all the time, right? We ask our friends, where should I stay in LA or Paris or yeah. this or that? And your friend, your best friend tells you, and you still check it out and see if you really like it yeah. and see if it looks like what you want, see if the bathroom's the way you like or whatever your thing is. So I think that's going to continue. I don't think consumers are really looking to take themselves out of the process right. and just say, you tell me machine what I should do. Yeah. Uh, and the machine, you know, has to, by the way, the machine to do that well has to know you and your likes and your tastes and whatever. You don't want the answer for society. You want right. the answer for you. So I think there's a journey of meshing those capabilities with the personal data and consumers' experiences. And we have a lot of that, obviously, for our consumers. So that's an advantage for us. Um, and I think the whole agent process, I think, gets a little overrated because people skip to this idea that like, oh, it's so hard if I could just push a button. But most consumers don't actually want that. They yeah. really want to take some of the joy out, out of yeah, it. I think. Yeah, you know, yeah. like you plan your your I don't know your holiday with your family for a long time. It's like, oh, mm -hmm. we'll go to Europe this year. Won't it be nice? We'll be in France. We can do that. You know, like that is the process. Yeah. And you read and you ask friends and whatever. Now you can ask a machine. That's super interesting. And the machine can offer you a lot of guidance that you might want. What's near the closest train station? What's this? What's that? What should I see? But I think it's going to be a really long time till we all decide that like the machine knows everything better than right. what I want and right. I don't have to look, I don't have to read, I, don't, I just have to push a button. I think we're a long, long way off from that. Yeah. Um, talk to us a bit about what you're doing with this EG Labs. I think that launched last fall. Yeah. You're in effect giving consumers a chance to test some of the tech that That's you're right. exploring. Yeah. I mean, I, there's, um, you know, I could take you through little things we're doing, but in re the bigger picture, what we're trying to do is make sure that the innovations we discover and we think are interesting to people, we're allowing consumers, some, a certain subset of consumers to get a first shot at, see how they use them, see if they like them, see if they whatever. It's, it's sort of more broadly part of our overall journey to make the experience as good as we can. So we'll give you Gen AI, we'll give you, you know, a loyalty program, we'll push you into the app, we'll do other things to make it better. And this is one where we can test features. Um, we have all kinds of features coming out all the time now because we're just built in a different way and we can go much faster. And uh, part of that journey is not just to hit you know, the world with everything all at once, but to test through some of these and see how consumers interact with them and what they like and don't. So the lab gives us a way to sort of circle that up and say, okay, let's see how people interact with this. Let's see if they like it. Let's see if we can make it better and before we deploy it to the world. I'd, I'd imagine you probably have like some super testers that are all in and want to like test yeah, everything. I mean, and like, then some it's like are... everything in, in, this, <laughs> in these spaces. You know, there are people who are really into it and yeah, want to play with yeah. it all the time and or travel so much and they want to be part of shaping that. And, you know, and there's lots of people who just come through, you know, yeah. transact and they're not looking to participate. So let's let's shift a bit and talk about the B2B strategy. That's mm. been another topic that we've heard quite a bit about in the last yeah. couple of years. You've got some really big partners, uh, MasterCard and, and Walmart you're working Tons, with. Yep. Um, tell us a little bit about what, what you're getting from those relationships other than bookings that are coming through and things. I mean, yeah, I, I mean, I think the way we approach it is, you know, we are a marketplace. We're a marketplace for suppliers, you know, this convention, lots of hotel owners are, you know, in our marketplace, uh, airlines, car rentals, you name it, right? Everything's in there. And um, what we observe is there are pockets of demand that we either won't naturally reach uh, because they're coming through these loyalty programs or something else, or they're booking on an airline site and they want to keep everything there. And, and so what we're trying to do is enable all of those prospective partners to sell through uh, what we offer and right. make it simple for them, use technology to make it really easy, use technology to make sure they're selecting the best rates and the best everything for their customers. Um, so we continue to advance the technology, we continue to advance the marketplace. Um, we've done a lot in uh, this optimized distribution, trying to um, really wrangle the wholesale market and make it more more clean and functional and so that we protect the rates of people like hotel owners and others. Um, but what this does is it allows us to go many places in places where we compete as uh, as retail competition and in some places where we don't um, and go to partners and say, you can onward sell this content. You can use this supply, this great supply we have, use our technology, 
um, and you can build your business with what we've already done the legwork essentially right. for you. And so whether it's an airline, a loyalty program, Walmart, uh, credit card companies, you name it. Um, and there's really like, there's very, and there's, you know, there's, uh, there's travel agents, there's all kinds yeah. of different things, offline travel agents we power. So all of that is an opportunity for us to just serve more customers, help more partners build their business and really provide more demand for our supply partners, which are, you know, hotel yeah. owners and everyone across the world. It, it certainly does feel like in the last few years, like everybody wants to sell travel. You know, we've heard so much, we've covered yeah. a lot of, about the banks getting in and, and all of yeah, this. So it's, it's um, so I imagine there's going to be a lot more growth there. I do have to ask, you know, of course, one of the big topics of the last year was the cut with Hopper, mm -hmm. cutting ties with yep. Hopper. Anything, any more perspective you can share on that? And, and is that something, I mean, do you, do you review each of your partners very closely to kind of look at how they're operating to determine if it fits with your thinking? Yeah, uh, yeah. we certainly do that on the way in and we do that along the way intermittently. And we certainly try to do that if we see any change in behavior or, or how people act. But I would say broadly, you know, we're trying to have the cleanest, best marketplace that exists in travel. And, and that means both sides of the marketplace. It means, you know, we don't want suppliers that are consistently giving consumers bad experiences any more than we want demand partners that are consistently not giving consumers experiences that, that we think are reasonable. So, um, and, you know, empowering either one or letting it continue is sort of flies in the face of having the cleanest, best marketplace that we can provide. So, you know, we made some judgments about the way Hopper was doing business about the way they sold things to consumers. We felt like it didn't represent our supply the way our suppliers would want it represented or, you know, be complicit in that whole experience. Um, so we, you know, we, we decided to make a change. It's, um, you know, we've, they're not the first, they won't be the last, okay. um, you know, and, and we continue to do it all the time. And, and again, not because we have something out for any partner. We, we just assume we have more partners and more business. That would be great. Um, but we do want to keep our market sort of sacrosanct and, and clean and, and, and operating the right way for both sides of the marketplace. And so we make those decisions. So let's talk a bit about how you're looking at bringing in new users. Mm -hmm. Now this of course is getting back to more of the B2C side of things, but how are, you, how are you bringing in younger generations, let's say? Because I'll be honest, I know, you know, I have children in their 20s and I talk to them and their friends and I don't know any of them that are using an OTA. Well, I think um, I talk to others and I have 20 year olds too. Um, of course, they have a bias for their dad <laughs> working at one. But um, the uh, look, I think lots and lots of 20 somethings are using OTAs, put aside the US, but across the world. Uh, lots of the world is still coming more onto online, you know, in terms of travel than right. it used to be. It depends what part of the world you're talking about. Um, and, you know, how do we do it? We do it by making products that make sense to them. And I think giving them the ability to shop better, to have a much better app experience, to have all the features and sliding and thing, deleting and comparing and all the things that have become, you know, their first language is part of what's making, you know, part of what our journey is to make a great app, to make a great experience. Now, I want it to work for, you know, a grandparent as much as I want it to work for a 20 something. Right. But the expectations of quality and content and other things, you know, we have much more, we're adding social content so that customers, uh, Customers can see what other people thought of a property or something based on social content. Um, we we now have campaigns across TikTok and across Instagram okay. for, you know, that, that are very yeah. popular. We have a Hotels.com uh, thing called it's about the top ten things that celebrities like. You know, that look for at hotels. It's been hugely popular. Um, Expedia now has one as well that's uh, based on like celebrity journeys. Um, you know, so, so we're going where they are, okay. um, we're giving them, you know, really easy ways to get into the product and, and a much more sort of young, modern user experience that they're accustomed to in other things. Um, and we'll continue to go on that journey. And I think, you know, 20 somethings, you know, don't travel as much. They're often just shopping on price. Right. You know, I always say like my 20 year old who could stay at a crappy, whatever right. for, 80 bucks is not me or you or, you know, right. whatever. But so, so consumers are looking for different things, but I think, you know, we continue to give great experience. We continue to give them new tools, whether it's flight tracking or other things, and we're seeing good usage from young people. So I don't think there's a generational shift. I mean, it's certainly not going to go back offline. 
And the question is, who's going to lead in terms of the consumer experience that makes it appealing to young people? Um, which I don't think is like, uh, you know, it's got music videos on it or it's got right. whatever. It's just like, is it easy? Does it make intuitive sense to them? Can they get everything they need easily? And that's what we're trying to do broadly. Do you have, I, I realize you maybe can't share this, but do you have demographic data then on your users? Yeah, do we have a, demographic yeah. data. I mean, and we can tell by their trip type and whether they have kids and all those, you know, like all those yeah. things. And we match data and do all kinds of things to enhance data. But, um, but we don't sit around, I'll, I'll say candidly, you know, we're trying to serve everybody. And in the service of everybody, you know, you've got to be able to serve those things. It's like, you know, there are, we have dedicated customers who still shop all the time on their desktop. Right. And it's like, okay, I don't know what made that. You know, it's, it's right. sort of like people still have you know, Yahoo email or AOL, <laughs> like it happens. And then we have people who came in on the, you know, the, their first experience was on the app. They stayed in the app. That's what they do. That's right. what, so right. And, and some are young, some are old, it's all over the place. And it's very different geographically. So, okay. you know, there so, are countries that are basically phone first as right. far as the internet right. goes. And there are countries like ours, which are not. So. so that brings us to talk a bit about your global strategies. I've heard you talk about growth in APAC and LATAM in the yeah. last year, you know, six months, year. Um, where are you looking at growth? I also heard you say you're going to go selectively after the most valuable markets. So yeah. what does that mean to you? And, and then also, I'm just curious to get your thoughts on, you know, clearly there's geopolitical instability, mm. you know, what that might mean. Yeah. So, I mean, at its core, I'd say in, in our transformation over the last four years, in many respects, we pulled back in some places because we felt like we didn't have the product we really wanted where, where we, we didn't have it where we wanted. We weren't really set up the best way to capitalize in some of these other markets. And we didn't want to be wasting money and chasing something impossible. So now that we've been through this massive transformation, not only technologically, but with the brands and with a focus on fewer brands, et cetera, we really feel like we're ready to go back on offense. And that's, that's frankly pretty exciting for the company. Um, we know there are markets where we used to be stronger, where we can go back in and we have brand recognition and go. Those are big travel markets. They know our brands. Uh, we know we can push. We can now do a lot more with the product. Right. You know, a brand that might have been limited to maybe one line of business can now do multiple lines of business. There's lots of new ways we can go after these markets, and we have a much more, a much better understanding of consumers, of consumer lifetime value, and a lot of other things, which sadly we didn't have as cleanly as we wished. You know, a few years ago, and now, so when we go in. We can go in with a really dedicated marketing strategy to capture the right customers with high lifetime value that can deliver what we need. We can go in with the right product market fit so we know that the product's in a great place, the loyalty program's in a great place. Right. It's set up to win, and we can really go back on offense in, a, in an exciting way. So that's, there's some big countries in Asia, there are some big countries in Europe. Um, there's a few other smaller countries that we're testing, and we're also, we're also gonna try to go into some new places and try some different approaches and see if we can break through in ways that that uh, that we didn't used to be able to now certain parts of the world are growing faster than other parts and there's all of those macro things but um we're really going at it based on where the best travel markets are where we have the best product market fit where we have the right to win and that's that's what we're doing and how concerned are you about some of the geopolitical instability and, and what that could mean for travel this year as a human i'm pretty concerned um yeah. From a travel standpoint for us, um, you know, it depends kind of what these halos become, you know, uh, the Middle East and the issues uh, in Israel right now, um, those were a moment and they had a little bit of a contagion effect, meaning like international travel, people weren't so sure. Um, doesn't look like that's a long lasting problem, but certainly in the Gulf region, that remains an issue for travel. Not the biggest business for us, but it right. remains an issue. It's really when those, you know, Ukraine and Russia, likewise, like terrible, but um, but not a big part of our business. The question becomes when that scares people in other places right. about wanting to travel internationally or wanting to whatever. Um, that's where the danger is. I mean, there's always, I guess, danger of bigger geopolitical problems if right. you want to go there. Um, so that danger is always there. I mean, the climate issues are increasingly problematic, although we were graciously blessed with a not too bad winter in the in North America, but other parts of the world had issues and there'll be fires and there'll be other things. So there's always going to be something I think that's kind of factored into the marketplace now. Yeah. Um, 
and you know, I pray for everybody that we, that those things settle down. But, um, for us, it, it's not like the top five things we're worried about in a given year. Like we're worried about execution. There's plenty of business out there and, uh, you know, knock wood, we won't have any big geo, you know, big, yeah. big, big geopolitical problems. So when we think then about what you are worried about and what you are mm -hmm. thinking about, you know, you've used the term back on offense. We're getting ready for the Super Bowl here in the yeah. U.S. Yeah, you know, yeah. do, you, do you have a team? Uh, not at this point. <laughs> okay. All right. So w when you think about going back on offense, what's at the top of your playbook then? If you take that analogy. Um, top of our playbook is really kind of the, I hate to repeat myself, but the stuff we've been working on, it's really great product. Uh, it's continuing to push uh, machine learning, AI, personalization, which I think is the next frontier really for travel. And I think we're leading in it and will lead in it. Um, I think it's, as I mentioned, you know, great marketing, making sure we penetrate, making sure we reach the people we want to reach um, and making sure we're really crisp about who those are and what we right. do. Um, and, um, and I think, uh, you know, we're really, we've kind of, the way I talk about it in the company is we've been through this kind of period of mash surgery, like we're doing everything all at once and you can't be perfect and you got to be messy and you got to get through it. And now this is really a year of execution for us. It's like precision execution, use the tools we've built, put them to work, deliver it for the customer, uh, deliver it for our partners. I think that's what this year is about for us. And that's, that's how we go on offense. And I should say for my colleagues, San Francisco. And they're, they're all Niners fans, so I, I should say that. <laughs> okay, fair enough. Well, as we are wrapping up here, I just want to kind of change gears a little bit and just get you to reflect a bit. Um, first of all, any advice you might have for young people getting into the travel industry? Yeah, I mean, travel. listen, I, I think travel is a great industry. I mean, we all love it uh, because we experience it. I mean, travel brings a lot of joy to uh, most people in the world. It's some of our most, you know, I used to say when I started, like no one has a picture of their their car on their refrigerator they have a picture of their trip <laughs> right. to jamaica or paris or right. something um you know those are the memories we build like so travel is a great experience there's a thousand ways to participate i mean there are thousands of hotel owners at this conference and they're all in the business of literally building hotels um and then there's otas and there's chains yeah. there's airlines there's a million ways to play so i think it's a it's a huge category you know it's a two two plus trillion dollar industry across the globe it allows you to experience a lot. So I think it's uh, I think it's a super exciting area for young people. But um, I think the most exciting areas will continue to be in technology. You know, it's one thing if you want to feel it and touch it and be in pure hospitality, then you should go do that. But there's a lot of exciting things happening in technology. And, uh, you know, we wanted one of the things we went through was transforming ourselves to a product and technology first company. Um, and I think, you know, I think there's going to be tons of exciting stuff to do. we will be a great place for people who want to do that. But, you know, I, I wouldn't blame you if you want to work at a hotel in the Maldives and yeah. you know, like that sounds pretty great, too. Uh, so, yeah. Um, so I, I think it's a great space for young people. And I think it's a category that's going to keep growing. And, um, you know, as I tell as I tell all our young people, like, you know, careers aren't generally linear. They're not just one step in the next. Like you got to there's some serendipity. You got to yes. follow what interests you and do your best. And so I think there's loads of opportunity in that for for hundreds of thousands of people in the world. So yeah, we could have a whole nother discussion about your serendipity and your steps along yeah, the way. Some other all, <laughs> all happy accidents. Yeah. <laughs> so finally, just one other question for you personally. I'm curious as now you're entering into very soon entering into year five mm -hmm. uh, as Expedia Group CEO. How do you how would you say you've done on work life balance for, for Peter Kern? <laughs> well, I'll tell you what I tell our young grads when they come in. I'm not a real believer in this, the conventional idea of work-life balance. Um, I always say you have to make peace with work. Like if work, work's part of your life. In fact, in many cases, it's the biggest part of your life in some periods of your life. And if you don't sort of say like, that's part of life and I'm going to integrate it into who I am and what I am, it's really hard to be happy. If you have to like shut the door on one to make the other possible, yeah. it's really hard to be happy. So I believe, you know, you make work part of it. I've certainly made it a large part of it. It's this is like a 24 hour a day job. Um, but, you know, but I also enjoy that like it drives me and, and uh, I'm really driven by the idea of fixing big problems. And, and uh, pe people in my company asked me when I joined, you know, why are you doing this? You didn't need a job, whatever. Um, my answer is I like taking groups of people and solving big problems that they didn't think they could solve. And, and so 
that's really satisfying to me yeah. in my life. And I think like everyone needs to find, yeah, there are times, plenty of times work sucks and you don't want to deal with it and everything else. Um, but I've sort of just integrated it into my life. So I don't think I've had a vacation in four years, but I've been a lot of amazing places and I've had an extra day in Tokyo or an extra day in uh, Delhi or an extra day right. in London. And that makes my life fulfilling. So I think uh, everyone's got to find their peace with that. And yeah. look, there are times I, I had some crappy jobs and worked 20 hours a day and wasn't always fun. But I do think you have to find that. You can't like make work the enemy of life. You have to yeah, that's somehow a good point. make them work together. Well, you have certainly, you said you take joy in, out of accomplishing big things and solving big I problems. Do. And certainly in the last four years, we've seen a lot of development. So I appreciate v that. Very interesting. Lots Peter of joy Kern. to be had. Yeah. <laughs> wonderful. Thanks. Thank you so much for talking to Thank me. Thank you. All Good right. To be here. Thank you.